Hey, we got more Skellige. Skellige is always fun, right? This one's a little bit different. This one is a little bit more tricky. All right, so we're getting into this. We'll speed this up a bit. And this is a like a like a really nice looking hand, by the way. I have a, my white frost here. I have a muzzle. I have a wild dot hound. I have a rider, Iris, Aridan, Lieutenant. I forget what his name is. And he's he, he's not even probably a lieutenant, but anyway, he looks like Aridan to me. And then we have our crone. So this is a really nice looking hand going into this. And I'm going second. So how could we possibly lose, right? This now this is uh this is troublesome, right? What do you do in this situation if opponent plays a spy on you? Now, typically, I'm not actually a big fan of this action unless you have a way to immediately pass that tempo advantage without giving up too much. Uh, off of recent memory, that's probably pretty much just Emir spies right now or John Kevitt spies, whatever spies. Uh, so otherwise, eh, I'm not, not a big fan of this move. But otherwise, how do I deal with this? How does how does the king, the king's decree deal with this? actually forget what what seriously what do i do looking at this right now uh this is a situation as it is uh so this is a strengthen this is a strengthen crack on crate or it's possibly an axeman i mean uh yeah an, an axeman crack on crate wait is that guy's name even crack on crate that guy is so unused i actually forget what his name is it's bran it's Harold, and it's crack on crate yeah okay so we should be fine um so in, in that sense, and since he's playing a spy early, this kind of gives me the idea, hmm, this guy either wants to not play reactive or he doesn't want to play proactively. He wants to play reactively or he has some kind of like long form combo deck where he wants very long rounds. So what I should be doing here is thinking I don't want to give up this round just yet because I know that's what exactly what he wants, because that's the kind of play that he's making. And this isn't necessarily something you look at and go, hmm, yes, the, you know, you one plus one carry the three, right? This isn't math or uh, this isn't some kind of equation that you solve based on the play that he's made. This is just something that comes from playing the game over a very long period of time and recognizing this card here, this faction here, and the card, the play that he's making. Now, some decks uh, could actually get punished really hard if they actually play into this, but I, on the hand, have a very low tempo play with my Wild Hunt Hound, so I'm totally fine going into this. The whole thing that I want to do here is just make this round. Uh, I, I want, I'm playing his game. I'm going to I'm going to play this round out. I don't want him to like, let's say, let's say I don't play anything in there and I pass. Right. He goes two cards down. Yippee. He goes two cards down. But actually, it doesn't actually matter because he's playing a, a long form combo deck. Or in other words, uh, like I said earlier, he wants the rounds to go as long as possible. And I don't want that because he'll beat me out with his value. I won't be able to outfrost him, especially with the cards that he's playing. So I need to make the rounds long enough to where I take advantage of frost and manipulation and control, but not so long that he is the one that actually comes out on top. But at the same time, they can't be too short or else I'm not going to get any value out of my cards. Whereas his cards come in, uh, come in at a pretty solid value. So it's kind of like a, it almost works like on a, on a bell curve in that sense. So the, the number one thing that I'm going to do here, this is really important. I'm going to muzzle this card away. Now, there are several reasons for this. <clears throat> the number one reason, this is a high tempo play. This is an easy muzzle target. I take it away before he has a chance to do anything to it. So in that sense, uh, it's a very proactive play in a hand that doesn't really have any other plays going on. And using muzzle is not only a good play, but it's one of my only plays. So that's probably the biggest reason. Uh, the number two reason, why am I taking this card over other cards? Now this card, uh, it, it does not regress. That means when it goes to the graveyard, it's going to come back at uh, its full strength. It's full boosted or not boosted, but um, uh, gain strength when it's on the field, right? So in other words, let's assume he's using three Priestess of Freya, right? That means he'll bring, be able to bring this card back like two to three times with that boost of strength, no matter even if I do actually kill with Frost somehow, right? Which means this is always, this is this will be a constant threat. All three of these cards that he has, these three great swords are going to be three great swords that can scale up to like six great swords that are just going to be a pain in my back for <laughs> you, you two, please no censor. Uh, that would be a, a pain in my back for the whole time, right? So if I take it away, I'm not taking away just one. I'm taking away like two to three great swords because he can't revive them. He can't use them. He can't combo off of them. So it's a really big uh, piece to take away in that aspect. But and reason number three 
is because this blocks my frost because it's a relatively low strength when it comes in. It's going to soak up this uh, this frost. It's going to soak it up, soak it, soak, soak, it, soak it up. And then it's going to heal all the way back up to nine or it's going to heal up to seven and then go up to nine. And then it's going to restart that process over again. And it's just going to keep soaking up my frost and my frost will be doing absolutely nothing. Whereas uh, this next play that he plays. Oh, no, he just plays on another great sword. If I had another muzzle, boy, howdy, I would play another muzzle, but I don't have one. So I just pass here, right? Because he's in the frost. Um, uh, I haven't really committed too much to this round. He's going to have to uh, pass me with math 16 points, which will be at least two cards. Now, I did say earlier, but King, you said you you don't want this long round, right? But he committed one of his combo pieces and he put it on a frost row, which is going to be very difficult to deal with. So if I can, one, uh, cut my losses on this round because he played out a combo piece. I played out a frost that's not going to get any, get, uh, get any value. And two, I can make him go two cards down, which is just going to inflate my advantage later on. Then I'm going to go for that. <laughs> so that's how that works. <clears throat> Although it's not necessarily, uh, I think if you would keep compare the deck I'm going up against against like an Axman deck, I would, and like I had similar, similarly poor situation and like, uh, you know, board control or whatever, I'd probably take it to the Axman because I know Axman skills so much harder as the round, as the rounds go on. So, but when I'm going up against this deck, they're a little bit less uh, snowball-y in that sense. They scale a little bit less hard. Okay, let's speed this up. Something I wasn't really expecting is him to pass me in a single card with uh, Jing Fret, Jing Fat, Fret, whatever, which is really unfortunate. If I had uh, if I had tied there, that also would have been uh, not so great because then we get one really, really long round three, which is not good. Even though he's basically going to uh, he's inclined to basically do the same thing anyway. So he plays out his Jing Fret. That's kind of good, I guess, because that takes away that combo later on. But I would have preferred him to go two cards down because it gives me more control over rounds two and three. So going to go this, draw a crone, not good. I can just mulligan that away. And that's kind of the thing with crones, by the way. Uh, when you mulligan a crone, it's not like mulliganing away a bronze card. This didn't mess up, did it? Okay, there we go. It's not like mulliganing away a bronze card that can't be brought back into your hand because each crone is a different card. I can mulligan away crone whispers and get the other crone, the third one on the right side, right? So something to work, uh, watch out for. And in fact, some players will actually do something really crazy that if they know that they're going to use crones as a finisher, then they'll mulligan all, all of the crones out of their opening hand so that they... Uh, so that they are more likely to draw in later rounds because they won't draw it in their opening hand. Uh, man, I really love like crone strategy, man. Crones were so great. So there's another one of his combo pieces. So that's his third great sword, right? I took one. It's in my graveyard. He cannot access that unless he plays um the silver lock unit, which I don't think he's actually running. Mo like most people don't even run that card anymore. Yeah, I don't remember his name. The silver lock card, the skull gas. Uh, and one's in the graveyard, which means he's easily going to be able to revive that. And he has one down in the field. Now, what's great about him having one down in the field now is that I know I can uh, I don't need to place my frost there. So instead, I go ahead and place this down because I actually don't know where he's going to place his next unit yet. And I want to get my frost value off at the same time. I need to be able to pass him on strength or else I'll just get passed on. So that's why I did the Wild Hunt Rider first. And of course, uh, this is a good opportunity to break up your hand. Am I going to play my... Aridin Lieutenant? Nope. Because I have no unit to pull. I don't need I don't know where the frost is going. Am I gonna play Crones? Nope, that's a finisher. I'm gonna play Aris. I obviously no. Not only is it not gonna pass me, that's a huge combo piece. Wild Hunt Rider, it's fine. I just played it. Drowner, not good. I'm gonna damage this. He's gonna heal it. Uh, I'm not entirely sure what's gonna be called up from the Slizzards. I think like again, the, or I don't know if again, I've recorded this thing like five different times. Um but one problem I have with this deck is that I think there's too many slizzards. I think there's like one to two too many slizzards. But otherwise, uh, I'm pretty sure this will pull frost. It'll be three plus four, seven. I'll only tie. He'll just pass me, and then we we'll go into round three, which is not good. And playing out Aridin is not necessary because I can just uh, pass him with two points on this. <clears throat> That's more or less how I came to this decision. So he plays out this. This is really good for me. Because I don't really care about the value I'm getting off that Wild Hunt Rider. And it saves my, uh, like, because they can use, 
they can turn the figurine into into their own unit, which means they could turn it into they could uh, get rid of my iris value later on. So it's good that I'm dealing with that now. But I can just pull out another wild hunt rider if I want to. Which I definitely will. Although a troublesome thing about it being jade, uh, turned into a jade figurine is that when it does go to the graveyard, uh, or rather a wild hunt rider does not go to the graveyard, which means I can't slide lizard it. Which is another problem I have with Slide Lizard. Like Slide Lizard is really, really cool because it allows you to thin through your deck like a like a Reaver Hunter, which is fairly Oh, never mind. I was gonna say it's it's unique to No Other Realms, but it actually totally isn't. But uh Monster doesn't really have anything like that, and it was really cool to get that. But at the same time, uh th this can be like an entirely dead card. So there he goes. He's starting to uh, fire up his engines. If I was him, I actually would have gone for a long round three. I'm not really sure why he's trying to fight out round two, but we'll deal with it anyway. So now I'll play my Airden because I want to stay above him in value or in uh, tempo. At the same time, I want to drag this unit away from this unit. So it's a twofer. I not only get frost off, I not only get value, but I also separate these combo pieces from interacting with each other. So that's why that card is like, this is one of my favorite cards in this deck because of things like that. So he plays out uh, another one, right? And I just need to just keep separating these cards. I need them to stop getting value. Now, what would you do? Would you use a drowner on the ship or would you use it on the, the, the great sword? Just think about it for a second. And I use it on the great sword. Why? Because uh, if I did use it on the ship, great. I put the ship away, but... Uh, the great sword would eventually be left in the frost and it would just be soaking up the frost damage So I'm taking a bit of a minor hit here uh, by allowing him to heal up this damage So that in the future I can do more damage on the ship with the frost <coughs> So he plays out another one he plays out his uh wild boar of the sea I go for the sly lizard pull out the wild hunt hound and I start to get that to work on the back row not for any particular reason, but because I don't really have all that much left to do. And at the very least, this frost will be ticking down on the wild board of the sea and on this uh, Priestess of Freya for a little bit. <clears throat> so by playing the frost in this back row, I give myself a little bit of buffer while at the same time not affecting my future uh, by not, allowed, not allowing him to um, culminate too much value off the back of that buffer. All right, but things are going well so far. I haven't played out my crones just yet. I may not need to. If we get down to just one card each, I will 100% win or 99.99% win. So he plays out yet another one of these ships, which is interesting because uh, I'm not sure. If, how did Skull get used to pull out a card from the deck? Were they even able to? Well, anyway, so they got this new Heimei Maiden, which allows them to be a little bit more consistent with their deck which is probably why this the strength in deck has risen up in popularity lately it's because they're so uh they're able to get some of their key combo cards out more effectively so i play out my wild hunt rider again to just uh, have a bit of a buffer these silos are useless this fr white frost is useless if i use these cards at all they're going to be a, as a buffer but at the same time i don't i want to make sure i stay relatively high above him in value because i don't want him to like explode in value and then just leave me in the dust and they go two cards down just because I was playing a little bit too cautiously. A little bit too uh, non-committedly is what I mean. Basically the same thing, but a little bit different contextual difference. Plays out another Priest of Freya, plays out the, not the long ship, right? Or unless he plays on the melee row. Yeah. So that, that's totally fine with me. He's not actually getting a lot of value off here. So I'll play the Iris. I know the Iris is going to get immediate value. I'm going to play that down. Now, th what this does is this sails me ahead in value, which means, uh, and since we're getting down to just a few cards left, this actually presents the opportunity where he tries to overbleed me when he tries to overbleed me, and I go for a hero pass, and then he's forced to uh, go, he plays one card over a kill. That's a little bit advanced, but basically the, the whole idea is I don't want to get passed by him in value. 
or in tempo rather in strength total i need to make sure to stay above him so i don't overplay the cards that i have here but at the same time this gives me room to have a plenty of buffer also it's very unlikely that i'm gonna have iris go off in round three so i'm just gonna get the value out now while i can while also st staying above him in strength while also preserving some of these buffers slash i can demolish these later cards now he's like oh but he just played an and he got rid of your iris value he didn't actually that's totally fine I, I got the value out of Iris that I want to get out of it. That's kind of like uh, back. I'm pretty sure it was just the previous game that I was saying uh, not to hold on to Iris too, too late or else you're going to um, run out of value for it. Right. You're not you're not going to get the value out of it that you want to get out of it. But at the same time, even if you, that's even if you're going up against a card, you know, you're going to be punished by. Now, granted, I didn't know he was going to have an Igni, but I pretty much go for the expectation that they do have cards like that. And it's perfectly fine because he he did what uh, Iris what in total was a 25 value play. And he did a total of like 20. I still got five points out of it and I still buffered the round by a little bit. Now, why do I want to buff for the round when he's the one who wants to make go as long as possible? Because I want to stay above his strength total while at the same time not playing out my crones. The crones will be the last card that I hope to play in this round. So at the same, well, if I can stay above him while not playing crones, then I'll do, use literally everything else. That's what I mean by buffer. And so I use my fr white frost. It's not going to get much value in round three. It's going to be a buffer for this round. That's kind of like the whole the whole like key of this matchup that I was playing. I was just buffering and buffering and buffering as long as possible. Now, Grant, yes, he wants to buffer, but I don't want to play crones. I don't want to buffer. I mean, I want to buffer long enough to not use my crones, but but not so long that I have to use crones. If that makes sense. Now let me pare that down. I want to buffer the round more than he does. No, 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 no. He wants to make the round go on longer. I'm just trying. No, no. Buffer was the wrong word. I should not have said buffer. What I wanted to do was to bleed him out. Yeah. Okay. He was trying to. He was thinking he was bleeding me out. Since he was the one in the, the power position of round two uh, as the winner of round one. And he was thinking he was bleeding me out of cards. But the thing is, I didn't. The, there was only one card left in my hand that I had uh, any like care about that had any value left. And that was Crohn's. He'd had to take me down to my very last card, which would be very difficult considering I had set up the previous plays with things like Iris. Right. And that's the whole point of playing Iris a little bit early. It allows me to stay above his starting total and not play Crohn's. So in the, that sense, while he's playing out all of his quote unquote valuable cards, I'm just playing out these crappy cards that I don't really care about. So I was bleeding him. I wasn't buffering. I was bleeding. I was bleeding him with cards that I didn't care about in exchange for cards that he cared about while staying above his strength total. And like, I'm repeating that like a broken record, but it's kind of the gist of it. It's kind of like, it's, it's a little bit difficult to explain because it's something you more feel, <laughs> which is like a really silly thing for someone who's quote unquote, like a coach or teacher or whatever someone's trying to teach. Like, oh, you just, you know, I don't know. You just feel it, <laughs> right? It's silly. It doesn't make any sense. I don't know what that means. Uh, but it's kind of something that comes with a lot of experience that you kind of like, oh, yeah, well, this, of course, that's what you do in this situation. Uh, or you don't consciously think about it, but like seeing it in action and like commentating over it allows you to see like firsthand how the whole thing is working. He's going to play out his Django Fret. If I had Caretaker here, I would have Caretaker first to get rid of that, but I don't have it. That would have been really nice, but I don't. So I set up my one on hider. Uh, this is where like sl sl slide lizards are coming in real big. Yeah, this is where it's, I hate that word. Slide lizard, slide, slide art. This is where the slides are to come in really big because they're not only uh, pulling out a unit from my deck. They're deck thinning. Well, I mean, deck thinning doesn't matter at this point, but they're pulling it out from my deck. But at the same time, the three point cards and on their own right. So I played on that back row. I could have played on the ranged row. I probably should have played it on the range row. I don't know why I did it on the siege, but regardless, <clears throat> this comes out really close, doesn't it? And like, keep in mind that I did save my crones for all the way until this finisher. And he plays out this, and I'm gonna pull it all the way back to the range row. Uh, one thing to make note: it, I guess, it doesn't really matter if it was on the range or siege in the in the. In the end, it didn't really matter. Hi-Evi play says to play it on the range row, though. Well, but at the uh, but also not to play it on the melee row. Do not play it on the melee because it would soak up the damage and then heal past it. Right. That would be terrible. And at the same time, I wouldn't be able to pull this card that he set up to combo 
on uh, at the back and then get more points off of. See, I'm only going to win by when it goes back to him. It'll be 15, 17. Oh, it doesn't come back. It was close. It was really close. Uh, just barely. But yeah, there it is. Uh, I'm not going to recap because I pretty much already said it like a million times. Uh, but thanks for watching. That's a Skellige strength and matchup. It's a really difficult one, especially if you're going up against uh, if you're going first, because that gives you an inherently disadvantage, uh, disadvantageous situation. <laughs>